finding the door. Falling away from our authentic self is thus experienced as a general phenomenon in life to which every facet of human culture is vulnerable. Its convenience, generality, and particularly its effects in the philosophical traditions are structural. For if this falling is a consequence of our absorption in the other, it must be just as much a part of our ontological structure as the fact that we generally fail to find ourselves. Thus, the tendency towards falling is an existential characteristic of default human beingness. Everyone and everything in the world is fallen away from its real being. It's convenient. It's easy to be inauthentic. Just go along with the program. Everybody else is doing it. Traditional philosophy simply describes our condition of being in the world and maybe offers some coping mechanisms to help us feel better about it. But it doesn't really change anything because it doesn't address our being. The cause of all this is the structure of being in the world. It's not anybody's fault. We can't blame them. We can't make them wrong for it because that's just the way the world is. We're thrown into this situation and we have a tendency towards falling into it again every time we try to get out. The ontological structure of being in the world does not make authenticity impossible but it does reveal a bias toward the ontic states in which we typically find ourselves. We always find ourselves thrown into a world whose roles and categories are structured in inherently impersonal ways, in which idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity predominate. It follows that inauthenticity due to absorption in the other is our default position. The bias of being in the world is towards impersonalism, seeing other people as objects and other people seeing you as an object. Impersonalism is a mode of monism, which itself is disguised duality, and it leads to being thrown into this state where you're simply treated like a tool. Uh, we keep looking for ourselves in other entities and phenomena, but we're not going to find ourselves like that. We have to do self-reflection in an authentic way to come to our real being. We can then find ourselves only by recovering from our original state of lostness. In practice, attaining authentic being always involves overcoming inauthenticity. The world into which we find ourselves thrown inherently tempts us to fall away from ourselves. The most pernicious part of our fallen state is the assumption, due to the inherent ambiguity of idle talk, that our fallenness is fully authentic and genuine. Look up pernicious, any good dictionary will do. In this world, inauthenticity is the default. Without some process, you will not be able to reach your authentic being because the inauthenticity is the default. It is considered ontologically as a modification of inauthenticity. And if we think that we're being authentic, we're really just being phonies because if you really look into the matter, you'll see that everything you think is you is something you got from outside some possibility that anybody could have. Being absorbed in the world of the other thus blinds us to our real condition. This blindness finds expression in frenzied activity, a constant curiosity-driven search for the novel and the exotic. Consequently, we remain alienated from the immediate environment and from ourselves, a self-alienation that sometimes takes the form of compulsive self-analysis, skepticism, and doubt. 
The errors of self-understanding in various philosophical traditions are simply localized symptoms of this more general ontological state. So the problem is that we can't see that we're fallen away from our authentic being. We think we're being real. But our reality is borrowed. It's not authentic. Curiosity is simply wanting to know about something, wanting to hear the claims about it, and not really inquiring into its being. So some people go into analysis, and they spend years in analysis. When you've heard the paralysis of analysis, that's because simple skepticism, without some process of attaining authenticity, will simply mask your inauthenticity behind a screen of so-called self-inquiry that really doesn't go anywhere. The same with philosophy. Philosophies that are not based on some kind of phenomenological process are not grounded in authentic phenomena, and they can't lead you to your real being. Thus, our everyday state of being is finding ourselves thrown into inauthenticity, as long as we remain more concerned with the other than with finding our authentic selves, we remain thrust into the world and overwhelmed by the turbulence of the other's inauthenticity. We can achieve authenticity, but when we do, it is only a modified way of holding our everyday condition of falling. Ontologically speaking, authenticity is a modification of inauthenticity. Our thrownness begins from our birth. The birth experience is tremendously traumatic. We're squeezed out like toothpaste through a tube. We think we're going to die. The pain is intense. The birth trauma encapsulates all the feelings and moods of that moment deep into our body. It's actually imprinted on the body, the cells. So we're overwhelmed by being in the world. When a baby elephant is growing up, they put a big chain on it, big heavy chain, and the elephant can't possibly break it. So at some point, the elephant decides, okay, I can't get loose, that's it, and they stop trying. And then even when they grow up, the same little chain that they use on the babies will keep a big elephant in check because they think they can't get away. We think the same thing. We think, well, inauthenticity is the way the world works, so I have to be like that. So the first step of the process of recovering our authentic being is to hold our inauthenticity in a different way that, oh, this is only one way of being out of many, many possible ways of being. It just happens to be the way I turned out. One way of characterizing this average everydayness, our inauthentic being, would be as self-dispersal. We are scattered amid the constantly changing objects of our curiosity, caught up in the collection of impersonal selves that make up the other, and fragmented by our skeptical philosophical self-dissections. Then where is the doorway to overcoming fragmentation, alienation, and inauthenticity? How can we attain a unified realization of our authentic being? In inauthentic being, our energy and attention are fragmented, scattered over many different objects. We don't ever have our full energy and attention on any one thing. That's part of the problem, and the solution is to collect our attention and energy and focus it on our real self. So where is the door to that process, to our real self? What is the process? How do we knock on that door and get it to open? That's what we're here to talk about. It's not a simple thing. It has a lot of aspects to it. It takes a lot of talking about it to get you to see it in your own experience, which is what this is about. The goal is a unified realization of authentic being, but that's very high. We're putting the bar very, very high here. If you can attain that, in the way that we define it, 
then you pretty much have life all sewn up in the bag. But this is very high and it's going to take a big piece of work to get there. So far, we have only analyzed the causes and symptoms of our inauthenticity. This narrow focus is needed in the beginning. Just as an authentic mode of existence requires overcoming our self-dispersal, so a genuinely integrated understanding of our being requires gaining a powerful perspective on our fragmentation that demonstrates our underlying unity. Now, it might sound like we're down on everybody. Huh? We reject traditional philosophy, we reject the everyday way of being in the world, and so on. But actually, we're not. We're like a doctor who comes in and says, you know, son, the problem is you don't have authentic being. Because we have to diagnose you before we can continue the treatment. That's the problem. Most people don't think they're sick. Our underlying unity, if we can find it, is very, very powerful. If we can take all the separated, fragmented parts of ourself and reunite them into a unified being, we're much more powerful than in our fragmented state. So the first step of this process is being authentic about the fact that we are inauthentic. Admitting and sharing and taking the stand that I am an inauthentic being. It's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, my name is David and I'm an inauthentic being. Anxiety and care. Fortunately, there is a particular state of mind that enables us to solve these problems. Objectless anxiety or dread. As a mode of existence, anxiety forces us to confront the true ontological structure of our existence. And as an object of phenomenological analysis, it gives us access to a single unifying articulation of our being. Anxiety is another big topic in our work. And here we see that it also has a triple structure and we've put it on the triple diagram. Um, Everyone is in anxiety, and we go through so much trouble to get rid of it, but actually we can't get rid of it. And that's a good thing, because anxiety leads us towards our real being. It leads us toward unity by counteracting the fragmentation of our being. This self-dispersal plus absorption in the world leads to oppression. And the oppression is the actual source of the anxiety, oppressed by being in the world. So anxiety is actually the perfect description of our inauthentic being. Because in inauthentic being, we are oppressed by being in the world. Anxiety is often confused with fear. Both are responses to the world as unnerving, hostile, or threatening. But whereas fear is a response to something specific, anxiety is objectless. The anxious person is not anxious in the face of any particular entity in the world. Indeed, the distinctive oppressiveness of anxiety lies precisely in not being elicited by anything specific, so that we cannot respond to it in any specific way, for example, by running away. Anxiety seems to be a problem without a solution. But if we encounter our anxiety authentically, it can silence the voice of the other. All those things that pull us in so many different directions and focus our attention on our real self. In the world, we have problems without solutions. The news, gossip, conspiracy theories, politics, stuff going on the, on the other side of the world that has nothing to do with us. Well, why do we care about it? Why do we get ourselves in anxiety about it? Well, we're already in anxiety. And the news and like that simply provides convenient objects for us to project our anxiety on and forget that it's actually part of our default being. 
What oppresses us is not any specific group of beings or objects, but rather we are oppressed by the entire world, or more precisely, by being in the world. Anxiety confronts us with the realization that we are thrown into the world, that we are always already delivered into situations of choice and action that we did not choose or determine, but that we have to care about and act upon. Anxiety confronts us with the determining and yet sheerly contingent nature of our own worldly existence. We are stuck with the way we wound up being but we could just as easily be any other way. Look up the word contingent in any good dictionary. We're thrown into the world, into a situation that we did not choose or determine. Yet, we have to choose one of the possibilities that is available in that situation and act on it. And then we don't get to choose the circumstances into which we're thrown. We don't get to choose the set of possibilities that we're thrown into. But we do have to care enough that it turns out right. And of course, we're always going to look back and say, well, if I had done it that way, it would have been better. Or if I had done it this other way, then so-and-so would have been pleased with me. And you can't satisfy everybody. That's just the way it is. So we're oppressed by the entire world, or actually by being in the world. The thing that's cool about the contingency of our being is that actually we could have been any other way, including authentic. So this idea that our being is contingent is actually the key to our freedom. But being in the world is not only what we are anxious about, it is also that for which we are anxious. In anxiety, we are anxious about ourselves, not about some concrete possibility, but about the fact that our existence necessarily involves projecting ourselves upon one possibility to the exclusion of all others. Existential anxiety plunges us into anxiety about ourselves in the face of ourselves. So in our anxiety, we are anxious about the world. That means concerning the fact that we are thrown and can't choose. And we're also anxious for being in the world because we want it to turn out according to the expected norms. When we look at ourselves in anxiety, we are anxious about ourselves, concerning ourselves, in the face of ourselves, when confronted with our own being, because our own being is also something we didn't choose, the way we just turned out. In this state of focused self-consciousness, particular objects, persons, and the specific structures of the world fade away as the world as a whole occupies the foreground. Thus, when taken authentically, anxiety can begin to rescue us from our fallen state, our lostness in the other. It throws us doubly back upon ourselves, as a being for whom our own being is an issue, and also as a person capable of choice, uniqueness, and individuality. When we confront our anxiety authentically, it reduces our fragmentation because it turns our attention on ourself. Instead of being scattered all over the being in the world, we begin to confront our authentic self that we are in a field of activity and we have responsibility for that field. And that field has a boundary. Within that boundary, we can be our authentic self. It reminds us that our being is actually an issue for us, that we didn't choose the way we just wound up. It was because of circumstances. We're contingent. So anxiety shows the claims of the other to be insignificant because even if we satisfy one or two of those claims, the other ones are still going to be unsatisfied. 
And that's because no one else can feel our anxiety. Therefore, our anxiety is our own. We are an individual. We're separate from all others. And we're not responsible for other people's anxiety, only for our own. Anxiety opens the possibility of our showing up for ourselves in a distinctive way, for anxiety individualizes. This individuation brings us back from our lostness and falling and makes manifest to us that authenticity and inauthenticity are both possibilities of our being. Our basic possibilities show themselves in anxiety as they are in themselves, undisguised by the entities of the world to which we usually cling. So, guess what? Anxiety is our friend. It brings us back from lostness and scatteredness and fallenness. It reminds us that we're in trouble in the world. Being in the world is not our real state. It's not our real being. It reminds us that inauthenticity and authenticity are both possibilities for us. And it also distinguishes the other as not ourselves by distinguishing our own individuality as the one who feels our anxiety. Now, in the default state of being, we hear idle talk, and it allows us to project our anxiety upon other objects. That's inauthentic. So when we confront the fact that we are anxious about the world itself as a whole, that's when we begin to feel our own being as a whole. And that is the next step of the process of attaining authentic being. By confronting us with ourselves, anxiety encourages us to recognize our own existence as essentially thrown projection and our everyday mode of existence as fallen, completely absorbed in the other. It emphasizes that we are always in the midst of the objects and events of daily life and typically we bury ourselves in them. We do this to keep from acknowledging that our existence is always more or other than our present actualizations, so that we are never fully at home in the world. Now, once we realize that we're the ones who are feeling anxiety, we start to realize that we're projecting ourselves, we're thrown into the world, and we care too much about the other. We care way more than necessary about the other. And we use the other to distract ourselves from ourselves. That's what it means by burying ourselves in the other. That we don't want to acknowledge that we can be more than what we really are. And as long as we care about the world, we can never be all that we can possibly be. We can never be fully at home in the world, and we can never be fully at home in ourselves. The way home. The experience of anxiety about the strangeness of being in the world exposes the basis of our default being as thrown projection, fallen into the world. Our thrownness, openness to states of mind other than our authentic self, shows us to be already in the world. Our projectiveness, capacity for understanding the other and planning for the future, shows us to be at the same time ahead of ourselves, aiming to realize some existential possibility. And our fallenness shows us to be preoccupied with the world. This overarching triple ontological characterization reveals the essential unity of our being in the world to be what we can call care. So here's another triple. It would help if you diagram these out for yourself. And you can use our triple diagram or you can use the regular RTF triple diagram that, of course, you looked up in the last video, right? In this case, we're talking about care. And care, the subject is our thrownness. The object is our projectiveness. And the relationship between them is fallenness. 
and the three of them to go go together to make up care. You could also say that the uh, subject is being in the world, the object is being ahead of ourselves, and their relation is being preoccupied with the other. All of those combine to take us away from our authentic self and make us absorbed in the world, scattered throughout the world, so that we are led away from our real authentic self. The existential totality of our ontological structural whole can therefore be grasped in the following formal ontological structure. Our being is always already in the world, thrownness, ahead of itself, projectiveness, as being with entities encountered within the world, fallenness. Now, the problem with our analysis so far is that it has been static. It doesn't include consideration of time. And we'll get into that in the coming sections. But so far, what we've established can be an ontological basis for our analysis of being in time. The analysis of care does give us a unified ontological structure of being in the world. And this is practical. If we can observe our own life and realize that to care means to be in anxiety about the world, but actually this anxiety does not have a present-to-hand object, then we have taken a step towards our authentic being. The triple elements of our everyday being are ultimately parts of a whole. By labeling that whole care, we evoke the fact that we are always occupied with the entities we encounter in the world, concerned about ready-to-hand and present-at-hand entities, and solicitous of other human beings. The point is that, being in the world, we must deal with the world. The world and everything in it cannot fail to matter to us. Look up solicitous in a good dictionary as check out the Latin derivation that links it with anxiety. Uh, there are also some other specialized terms here. Ready to hand means that an object is available for experience or use. It's right before us. Present to hand means that an object is observable for thinking about. It's not actually ready to use, but it's, it's around. It's within our awareness. In the world and everything in it does matter to us. We're not going to say, ah, we don't care. Uh, that's uh, taking skepticism a little too far. But uh, we do want to relate to the world from our authentic being and not our inauthentic being. So getting caught up in care about the world to the point where we get absorbed in the world is the way that we fall. That's how we leave our authentic being and become inauthentic. While being absorbed in the world is a fundamentally inauthentic state of being, acknowledging our inauthenticity is the first step on our path back to fully integrated, authentic being. This stand is a platform from which we can begin the phenomenological process of ontic self-inquiry necessary to recover our authentic beingness. So the way out of inauthenticity begins with being straight with yourself about the fact that you're in anxiety, about the fact that you're fallen, about the fact that you're being inauthentic, and also being straight with others, especially those who are trying to help you out of this trap. So Authenticity begins from being authentic about our inauthenticity, because in our default state of being, inauthenticity is all we've got. So our process at this stage is looking into your experience to identify your inauthenticity, and then being straight about it, being authentic about the fact that you're inauthentic. That's where it starts. That's how you begin to discover what you care about, 
how much you care about it, and what you're willing to do about it that does not compromise your authentic being. And we'll get into that in the exercises coming up. Exercises. Observe and verify in your own experience the following. Inauthentic philosophy. Objectless anxiety. Impersonalism. Being fragmented or scattered. The voice of the other. Thrownness. Problems without solutions. Thank you.